We're so thankful for you. Thank God for you. So thankful for you. I believe that this session is going to be a huge blessing to your life, to your home, and your family. Precious Heavenly Father, we believe we receive your help right now. We need your help to investigate the pages of your word, the truth, Lord, the treasure map that you've put before us. We need Holy Spirit's help to lead us and guide us and get the word, the seed of your word, in the ground of our heart so that it would produce fruit, everlasting fruit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Ultimate Living. This is Ultimate Living, Part 5, Seed Time and Harvest. And oh, I love the theme of this message. I love this message that God's given us, Ultimate Living. It's for your life. It's for you. Listen, let me help you get in the mood for a little agricultural talk. Is that all right? A little farmer talk. Let me help you get in the mood here. There was this couple, they were farmers and they were having marriage problems. Oh dear. One day she walked into the house with a chicken under her arm and she said, do you see this pig I was talking about? And the farmer said to her, woman, that's a chicken, not a pig. And she said, I was talking to the chicken. <laughs> In review, 3 John 2 sums up what God's been saying to us. Beloved, I wish that you would prosper being good health even as your soul prospers. That's really the essence of what ultimate living is all about. In part four, we recalibrated to the truth about the axiom, give to get to give. That's the landing spot. We identified the materialistic idol called mammon, that creepy thing, noting it's a cruel taskmaster, a heartless fake god. One day, a pastor tried using a rich parishioner in his congregation to set an example for everybody. He said, John, you know, you're a successful businessman. Surely you could contribute more to the building fund. John thought, and then he replied, look, my mother's in a nursing home. My daughter just lost her job. My son's starting college. And if I can say no to them, I can surely say no to you too. <laughs> Ultimate living is about cheerful giving, ventilated living, the cycle of breathing in and breathing out. John Maxwell said this once, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. I like that. In my experience with ministry, the top two requests I've heard for prayer is healing and for finances. The hopeful answer to these needful petitions often translate into ultimate living for many people. Physical healing, financial well-being. That's the get. But Jesus also addresses the give. That's the other side of the equation. In this part five, I want to tie all the elements that we've been learning of ultimate living together into a practical application under the heading of seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Let me ask you a question. What's top priority in your life? Because harvests don't lie. In this world, getting is just a beginning. Harvest is the outcome. Your divine design responds to, yes, it longs for the complete cycle of life. Proving once again that ultimate living is in fact binary. Giving and receiving. It's sowing and reaping. It's breathing in. It's breathing out. Harvests don't lie. Think about just one side of the cycle. If it was just about the getting, just think about it like this way. Well, getting a guitar doesn't make you a guitar player. You know that. Just like getting a race car doesn't make you a race car driver. Getting all the gold doesn't make you truly wealthy or truly blessed. Getting rid of the sickness or disease does not make you strong or a healthy person necessarily. The true art of getting is in your understanding of the giving. Give to live. That's ultimate living. Yes, giving is an art. That's what we learn in part four. It requires application, training, understanding, accuracy. There's got to be accuracy to your giving. Knowing how to give is ultimately knowing how to truly live. Seed time and harvest is the essence of the art of living. It's the cycle.
It's the cycle. There's a biblical principle to giving which has an agricultural bond or link. You see, there's an order to getting a carrot, right? Let's make it really simple here. You don't start with a carrot. You start with a seed. Once you get the seed, you've got to know how to give the seed to the appropriate ground. Right seed for the right ground. Right seed for the right ground. If you put the right seed in the wrong ground, no carrot no harvest. You've heard me say this. Context is not just something. It's close to everything. Well, God is a God of context. Jesus tells a parable of a sower in Mark 4, Mark chapter 4, who sows in various types of ground. The seed is not the variable in the story, but the ground, good ground and bad ground. The context is the variable. So let's look at this Bible principle, seed time and harvest, the binary principle of ultimate living. Genesis 8, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Seed time and harvest is not going anywhere, folks. It's here to stay. Einstein's principle of equivalence states that time and space are inseparably linked. So every seed takes up space and is therefore linked to time. It cannot be in two places at once. That's what it means. Until harvest. See, harvest changes it all. But to get a harvest would require that the seed be sown to cease to be what it once was. Now, couple that truth with the New Testament reference of seed time and harvest. Galatians 6 verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that and that only is what he will reap. You see, the enemy of your life needs you to believe seed time and harvest doesn't work. It's a wholesale lie that much of today's culture is biting down on. Why do we have so much crime, lawlessness, immorality? A whole generation is being schooled that the law of reciprocity, it doesn't work. It's invalid. You you can sow whatever you want and then you can pick your own designer harvest. That is a bold face lie. God says he will not be mocked on that issue. Comforting sweet lies make for uncomfortable, bitter realities. When we hear or see something, but we don't understand it, we are tempted to invent a bias. Then instead of submitting to correction, we participate in pursuing, chasing after confirmation bias. It becomes a distortion of your evidence-based decision-making power. There's nothing so dangerous as a lie you refuse to let go of and labor to reinforce over and over and over with your repetition. Self-deception is the grandest of all lies and quickly becomes an addiction. Your beliefs must stand up to critical thinking. The tough questions, at least, at least, at the very least, a, a Dr. Phil question. So, how's that working for you, right? My dear friend, do not be deceived, the Bible warns. Quit believing lies. Harvests don't lie. So let's look at how this works, practically speaking. With giving and receiving, we must understand God's principle, the law of reciprocity. Remember, God's not mocked on this. In this matter of sowing and reaping, God's not mocked. So don't be deceived. If you sow corn, we're going to get really practical here. If you sow corn, do you think you might get carrots? How about biscuits? No, you're going to get corn. If you sow weeds and thorns, do you think that you might have a nice lawn? No, you're going to get weeds and thorns. If you sow trouble, do you think you might get a harvest of blessing, happiness, opportunity? No, and no, and no. If you sow a bunch of hurt and destruction in people's lives, do you think that you'll reap health and healing? No. So let's practically apply this to pursue a particular harvest that you want. Do you want to have good friends? Then you'll need to be a good friend. So for the harvest. Do you want to be successful? Then help somebody else be successful. You sow and you grow. Do you want to overcome loneliness? This is a big one. Then sow kindness, friendliness into a person or an isolated senior. Help somebody else. Jesus said, do for others what you want God to do for you. That's Matthew 7, 12. Do you want help? Then sow help. 
We have the most amazing volunteers in the world here at Living Room Church. They sow help. They get help. When you sow competence, you harvest credibility. When you sow credibility, you'll reap influence. I got to tell you that out again because I know this is a big one. When you sow competence, you harvest credibility. When you sow credibility, you'll reap influence, a true harvest of influence. People want position so that they can be a leader, but true leadership requires seed, time, and harvest. Do you want to get healed? Have you ever prayed for others, had concern for other people, showed kindness to people who are sick and need a healing? Sow your faith. Yes, healing has faith seeds. Matthew 21, 21. And Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith, a firm relying trust and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. Your words are representative of the content of your heart, either for trust or disbelief. In Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure in his heart flings forth, brings forth good things. Your words represent the content of your heart for good or evil, faith or fear. Jesus would always say to the sick when they were healed, your faith has made you whole. Well, when did they plant those words representing their faith? When? Where did they sow? Matthew 15, 11. It is not what goes into the mouth of a man that defiles and dishonors him, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles and dishonors him. Is it faith or doubt coming out of your mouth? Praise or slander? Just like money is representative of intent, your words are representative of your heart. You see, this conversation, it gets so very basic when we talk about the lowest form of currency on earth, money. Jesus often talked about money, stewardship, commodities. Jesus talked about this stuff. I've heard people ask, well, if I can sow anything and get a harvest, can I sow money? Well, that's a great question. Here's what you must understand about that. Money is currency. It's representative. Not only does it represent a value from the federal treasury, but far more, it represents the motives, the content of your heart as the possessor of that money. Think of it this way. Currency comes from the root word current. It's the flow of money. And so it is the flow of your heart, your values, your motives, your character. How you handle currency is a basic view of your heart. That's why in Luke 21, when Jesus sees a widow putting two copper coins in the offering, what seems like a, a very, very insignificant amount in that day, Jesus said this. He said, truly, this poor widow has put in more than all of these others, for they gave out of their abundance, but she has given out of her lack and her want, putting in all that she had on which to live. Jesus was wowed by her giving. Understand, God wasn't seeing just two cents, her two cents. He was looking at the flow, the flow that it represented of her trust, of all of her heart. You see, your money represents your power of choice, your beliefs, or your fears, or your love, your priorities. Your money represents the flow of your faith, or your doubts, your virtues, or your addictions. What if we lined up a few people and examined the flow of a $100 bill in their hand? Look, one person's money would flow to her, her love for her children and her desire to feed them. Another person's money would be a bribe and an opportunity to be dishonest, a means to control other people. Then you'd have someone deciding to be unfaithful and immoral, possibly feeding a pornography addiction. But then someone else would use their $100 bill to express love for God and gratefulness for his blessing. Well, then another person may hide that $100 bill and hoard it. All because of the fear of losing and the desperate need to just, I got to get more, I got to hoard it, I got to get it. Someone else, they would invest that $100 bill in toys for underprivileged kids at Christmas, motivated by kindness. Each person's currency is basically a representation of flow, of the flow, the character of their heart. Now, does God see the $100 bill, the currency, or does God see the actual currency of the heart, the content of the heart? So the question is, can you sow money? 
Yes, to a degree, but understand that you are sowing, you are really sowing the flow of your heart, the content, the representation of your motives and your heart. Look at Luke 6, verses 44 and 45. For each tree is known and identified by its own fruit. For figs are not picked from thorn bushes, nor is a cluster of grapes picked from a briar bush. Well, that makes sense. Then Jesus said, the good man produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure in his heart. And the evil man produces what is wicked and depraved out of the evil in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of his heart. Let's try this with something as basic as an acorn. Right here, an acorn. Let's talk acorn theology. The acorn is quite a simple little fellow, really. He's basically three parts, an outer shell, a kernel with an embryo. In reality, the acorn is an embryonic tree to be all wrapped up in a simple little shell. Look at that. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this, the creation of a thousand forests is in one little acorn. Don't ever be deceived by or underestimate small beginnings. Insignificant beginnings are often the seeds to great things if it's sown. Walt Disney, did you know he was fired by a newspaper editor for a lack of ideas? Oh, Oprah Winfrey was repeatedly abused growing up and treated like she was worthless, but now she's a global brand worth over $2.6 billion. Albert Einstein, did you know he didn't speak until he was four years old? He didn't read until he was seven, and his teacher described him as mentally slow. What about Michael Jordan, the amazing pro basketball legend? He was demoted from first string on his high school basketball team. The experience was humiliating, but obviously it was motivating. Consider how a forest of oak trees is born out of such a tiny dream. This small beginning, this little acorn. As you well know, nothing can happen with a seed. Its destiny remains dormant until until it's sown. We begin to work the principle of seed, time, and harvest. That's when the seed comes alive. So let's look at this. Number one, it's humility. Think of this. As long as the seed is stored, retained, held, or in an elevated state, its future is stalled, latent, and undiscovered. Did you know that there was a 2,000-year-old date palm seed that was discovered, and then when it was finally planted in 2005, that's right, in the year 2005, it germinated. This 2,000-year-old seed germinated. That means it finally began to grow, multiply, and find its destiny. It needed the right ground to be sown in. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Oh, you might be saying, oh, Pastor Stephen, are you kidding me? God wants to exalt me? Oh, some of you are choking on that prosperity. It's a P word again. Word aversion, right? Word aversion alert. The seed must be humbled to the ground for its beginning to be activated. And the context of the ground, here's the critical thing. The context of the ground is critical. Put the acorn on concrete ground, nothing happens. The ground is the only variable in Jesus' parable of the sower. Discern the ground. Humility is lowering the seed, but it's also including discerning the ground of the seed. Humility. And number two, death. So from number one, humility, to number two, death. To have a future, you must die to the past. Cease to exist to it. You can't have tomorrow if you don't let go of today. Does that sound too easy? If it's so easy, why do so many people stay trapped in yesterday? You need to be free from one state to have access to your new living, your new life in the new state. Those who try to retain their old carnal nature while trying to accept their reborn life, they suffer. It's hard. It's hard to live this um, duality. Imagine a butterfly trying to still be a caterpillar and embracing the identity of a butterfly. Nobody respects the hairy butterfly in the room with a hundred little feet, right? 
It requires trust to let go of the past, but the future demands it. It's a non-negotiable. This is why Jesus has given us his death. We celebrate his death at communion because it gives us legal access to lay down our past, our sins and our failures, but it gives us permission to be reborn. Look at Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. Or are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You see, by faith, you were planted with Christ. That's what it means, planted with Christ. And then verse four, we have therefore been buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory and power of the Father, we too might walk habitually in newness of life, abandoning our old ways. Abandon those old ways. Say that word out loud. Abandon. You must abandon the old identity, the old ways, the outer shell. Every seed must die to what it was to be reborn into its destiny. All of nature testifies to this. And then once after you get from part two, which is death, you go to number three, resurrection. Do you know what's amazing about the little acorn? After going into the ground and being buried, it dies, meaning it ceases to be what it was any longer. It's reborn, but no longer a little nut. <laughs> no, no, no. Now the birth of a thousand forests has begun. A mighty oak tree has been birthed from this little nut. Jesus was speaking with Martha and he said this, John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me as Savior will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? See, that's the activation point. Martha, he's saying, do you believe this? Will live even if he dies and will never die? Pastor Stephen, what kind of double talk is that? Exactly what we've been talking about. Ceasing to be what you were to be a new creation, letting go of today so that you can have tomorrow, laying down the past to give birth to the future. So the principle of seed, time, and harvest is summed up in this. Number one, humility, bowing low to the ground, submitting under God's hand in true worship. Number two, death, ceasing to be what you used to be. It's not a bad thing. Letting go of your way, your opinion, letting go. And then number three, resurrection. You can't just stop at number two at the death part. There's got to be number three, resurrection, being born again, a new, from above, a new creature, not the old caterpillar, the new butterfly, not the old acorn anymore, but the oak tree. Second Corinthians 5.17. This is one of Pam's and my favorite Bible verses. Second Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, reborn, renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. See, that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, we are no longer slaves of sin. You see, we're dead to sin. We're dead to that old lifestyle. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, old things have passed away. That's great news. That's good news. There is no such thing as ultimate living without being united to Christ's giving. Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us, you and me. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Now that's giving. A giving you could never accomplish on your own, but Jesus did it for you. And he shares his giving with us. Jesus suffered in many ways, including, did you know this? Including having his lungs crushed that we might ventilate with life. That was part of the torture of the cross, that it crushed the lungs and that we might ventilate with new life in him. Jesus gives us our true identity. God supplies seed for the sower, time, life, faith, and love. Plant a seed today. Give your heart into the ground of God's love. See what God will do in your life. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, here's my heart. 
You gave me your life, dying on the cross. Now I respond to you. Come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Be the Lord of my life. Direct the current flow of my choices. Help me sow for the harvest. Thank you for saving me. Say this, I'm a child of God now. Say it out loud. I'm a child of God now. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.